Diversity Lab. And it's based on Diversity Lab's unique inclusion blueprint outcomes, which scores top law firms on diversity representation, year over year progress, and most significantly inclusion practices and actions. It's not just enough to get people in the room. It's what matters once they're there and how they are included. So our honorable firms met and exceeded many of the key inclusion benchmarks that Diversity Lab created. They track progress and inclusion by intersectional identities, ensure equal access to succession planning, analyze pay equity and business generation factors that impact compensation because we all wanna get paid. Uh, and they track non-billable or office hours to ensure fairness and have a written process to appeal origination credit. Um, in past years, CHIP's honor roll focused on gender inclusion, and this year it has expanded to recognize excellence in two categories, gender inclusion and inclusion for all, which includes lawyers of color, lawyers with disabilities, and LGBTQ plus lawyers. So we are featuring the five honor roll firms throughout this series. I'm so excited to have Nixon Peabody join us for this first one, really as a role model for actions that others can learn from and provide inspiration to work towards even greater progress. Nixon Peabody is one of only two law firms to be honored by CHIPS and Diversity Lab for excellence in diversity, equity, and inclusion for all. Please welcome Reka Chirovulo and Stacey Collier. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. So I'll give you quick introductions. Reka is an experienced litigator serving as Nixon Peabody's firm-wide chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. She brings a career-spanning passion for diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. And it's really obvious that she's done so much to support Nixon Peabody's pathway to this excellence in DEIB. So welcome, Reka. Thank you. And Stacey Collier is a member of Nixon Peabody's Labor and Employment Group. She previously served as the firm's professional personnel partner and is its first ever chief talent officer. Mm -hmm. Stacey focuses on growing and enhancing the firm's legal talent, driving diversity and inclusion, and developing and cultivating its people and distinctive culture. She's also a co-chair of the firm's cross-disciplinary diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies group, assisting clients in assessing their DEI strategies and navigating their challenges and priorities in the space. And it's clear to me that in learning about both of you and the work you're doing, this is why Nixon Peabody is leading in this space. I mean, it's just incredible to have those resources and be thinking about this actively engaging and being intentional about it. Uh, so congratulations on your recognition as an honor roll. Let's get right to it. Uh, tell us about what you did to reach your firm's goals and receive this honor. Um, I'll kick that off. Uh, so, off? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick us off. So. We've been building on our DEI efforts for many years now. This isn't something we just started this year. It's been a long game that we've been building. We've done this by focusing on our pipeline to partnership, our pipeline to leadership roles, and the retention and advancement of our underrepresented attorneys. So by staying the course and evolving along the way, we've been able to achieve some of our goals and ultimately receive this wonderful honor. So thank you. And our approach has been much deeper than just recruiting diverse talent. I mean, recruitment almost is the last step, right? By focusing on retention and advancement, we will and have seen progress on recruitment too. Uh, one example is that at least 50% of our partnership classes for the last five years have been comprised of members of underrepresented groups. And this isn't something we just woke up one year and said, hey, we're gonna make 50% of the people here partners. We've been building on it. We've been focusing on the pipeline. We've ensured retention, which ultimately leads to the results that we saw. Yeah, I mean, I can totally echo what Rekha is saying. It, it really, a huge focus on retention and culture um, and making sure that we're weaving DEI into everything that we do. It's not just about this is a diversity program. It's about this is a program and diversity is an important part of, of what we're talking about and kind of, you know, woven into everything that we do. What was some of the resistance you faced when you started this long game of integrating DEIB across all elements of the firm? Because I've worked in law firms for yeah. a long time. <laughs> and you, so you don't think, you don't think it's, some you, it's a utopia here? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it must be, right? <laughs> so I don't know that I, I don't I, I don't love to call it resistance. I love to call it a, a lack of understanding, right, about what we're trying to do here. 
Um, and that's really where, what we started with. One of the first things we did when I started here about seven years ago is we did a program on unconscious bias. And I know yawn, everybody does it. But what I was realizing is there was a fundamental misunderstanding about where biases come from, what they are, and how every single human being on the planet has it, right? Uh, so it was sort of a foundational piece. And once we got people to have that baseline understanding, we were able to build on it, right? Because any training, any education needs to be built on itself. And so the resistance is really about um, making sure people understood what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to give any specific group a leg up, right? This isn't about like, you know, tipping the skills in someone else's favor. This is about creating equitable opportunity so every single person in this firm can be the best version of themselves and succeed on this platform. And that's sort of the message we really try to put out there. And there's a role for everybody. Yeah. I think it's about fear, right? And and this isn't just about DEI. It's about anything that you, especially at a law firm where we tend to not be the uh, the most innovative across the board as far as our industry goes, right? So, you know, there's fear of, of messing up. There's fear of losing, of, of not getting what you need, right? And so, um, you know, trying to get people to understand what DEI is and what it isn't, I think has been, you know, one of the things that has been successful in, in bringing more people to the table. I, I also think it's really reinforcing the role of allies and sponsors um, and the fact that everybody has a role to play in this in order for it to be successful and effective. I and I'll it. even add one more. Oh, sorry. I'll add one more yeah. piece to Stacey. Stacey sits on our management committee, right? And um, and I report to our management committee. I report to our managing partner, Steve Zubiago and Stacey. And we are very clear that this is some coming from the very top. So there's almost no debate about, you know, whether we should really be thinking about DEI. It's we are thinking about it now. Help us figure out how. And that is an important message as well. It is really important that it comes from the top. And there's a sense that um, like you said, the word resistance, like if someone has a certain fear and you meet them, like with the must haves and the supposed to be this way, they kind of double down on their, what they're doing and it's hard. But if you invite them and you say, Hey, we're trying this, I mean, you, you might not get it right the first time. That's okay. Then there's this kind of re reducing the barriers to entry and allowing everyone to kind of just try and then figure it out and be like, oh my gosh, I totally said your name wrong. Can you help me out here? Like I did this thing and I wasn't totally inclusive. What can I do differently? Mm -hmm. Right. What are some of those narratives that are coming out in this process? I miss that. What are some of the what? Oh, some like, what are some of the reactions from partners, from people who have been positively impacted throughout the firm that you're noticing and saying like, oh, this is working. I, I, I Do you want me to take the lead on that, Rika? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, and before I forget, I want I I am still a practicing labor lawyer. And so I wanted to give the group a heads up that I have to pop off at, a little bit early. I wanted to make sure I said that before Monica asked us a really hard question. And you guys all thought that I just you know, <laughs> said, forget this. This is too hard. Um, <laughs> you know, I guess a, a, a couple of things. One we have definitely seen really strong and positive reactions to those partner classes that Rake is talking about, as well as with our work through Mansfield, um, the, the, the evolution and change and, and greater diversity of our management uh, teams, right? Our practice group leaders, our office managing partners, our, our management committee. And so, I think there's definitely a feeling that, um, you know, the whole see it to be it thing, right? That people feel like there's a place for them in the partnership, in the leadership, um, and that it's not this, um, there's only one seat at the table for somebody who's underrepresented and it's already taken. And so therefore I should either look someplace else or do something else. So I think that's been really exciting. Um, you know, the other the other thing we've seen while we hate to lose people, we have seen a, a large number of boomerangs, you know, people who, who are with us maybe at the beginning of their career, the grass looks a little greener, and then they come back and they, you know, they're our best evangelists of, actually, Nixon is walking the walk on DEI and um, the culture of inclusion is real here. So that's been really special, I think, for us. 
Yeah, absolutely completely agree with what Stacy said. Those boomerangs are really helping us spread the message. Um, <laughs> Um, but the other piece, we, we had our all attorney meeting not that long ago this fall. And um, one of the things that I heard from our research group members was the fact that we didn't just have the underrepresented folks up on stage talking about diversity. Um, they were up on stage talking about their practice, talking about firm, you know, future financials, whatever. There were topics and and just it was organically woven in to the entire agenda. And it wasn't this heavy handed thing saying, you know, let's have the woman talk about what it, you know, about diversity issues, which is important. But it also shows the culture that we are putting putting out voices in the forefront on things that are beyond pro bono and DEI. We're talking about things that are actually, you know, that are about, you know, client development, about, you know, all these other topics that are equally important that we're actually putting on, you know, making sure diversity is a part of that. Let's talk about money. I know that's a big part of it. Rick, as you've already <laughs> mentioned, pay equity. What are you doing to track and measure pay equity and how do you create that uh, equity across the firm? So a couple of things. One, we have we we have been over the course of the past few years doing equity audits. We, we piloted it in, for those of you who don't know, Massachusetts has one of the most aggressive um, pay equity statutes in the country. And so, and we have a large presence in Boston. So um, a number of years ago, we started doing uh, a piloting a self audit of uh, in, in Massachusetts of uh, all of our personnel in Massachusetts. And it was such a great exercise that we said, even though we don't have to do it elsewhere, let's roll out a pay audit um, throughout our other jurisdictions. So we're in the process right now of doing that. Um, you know, we have a lockstep compensation system for our associates. So that makes it a lot easier on the associate front. Um, but, you know, in our other populations, the staff population um, and our partner population, we don't, right? And so we need to make sure that we're not letting subjective factors that may mask unconscious bias, play a role in compensation decisions. Um, we did do our first ever um, uh, partner audit on gender recently, which I'm proud to say demonstrated that um, actually, this is a this is not a privileged conversation, but I will say that <laughs> um, you know our 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 women actually um, uh, were. Uh, a little ahead of our men uh, in the partner ranks. And one of the things that was fascinating about the audit was it tied um, you know, the, the single most determinative factor on compensation was your business generation success, right? And some of that goes into our credit sharing system and some of it goes into you know, opportunities that people have to develop business. So that's great, but you know, we can't rest on our laurels on that. We have to also be thinking about, so if MDA is what we call it, um, matter development credit, if that's um, the biggest factor in determining your compensation, then the next step is to make sure that we are providing equitable opportunities for people to share an MDA, to, to have those opportunities to be involved in pitches, um, and then I think, you know, it was it was great to see a lot of the initiatives that Rake has put in place around, um, you know, making sure that our pitch teams are diverse, making sure that um, when our marketing department puts together a panel, that it's a diverse panel that, you know, that that those sorts of things, while it's hard sometimes to see the connection from, you know, a little panel that happens in September to, you know, a deal that closes for a client that came in for that two years later, there is a nexus between those two things. And then that has a positive uh, impact on, on compensation. And, and to add on one thing Stacy said, our partner compensation system is transparent. All our partners know what the compensation is for each other. Um, and also our partner compensation committee is 60% diverse. Um, so, you know, there's all these, these, these checks and balances in the process itself that I, I think in addition to what Stacy described that helps helps with that. Mm -hmm. I've heard from clients who say that someone comes into the pitch and then doesn't bill any hours to a matter. 
And I know that you have developed something and you're using a workflow app. Is that helping mm -hmm. you to diversify the workflow across the firm? And tell us a little bit more about what you're doing to make sure this isn't, um, you know, tokenizing representation on a pitch, but not actually getting the credit. And I'll add one more uh, part to the mm -hmm. question, which is that I also see um, that sometimes there's a gap in equity because, because people are not being picked. And so then when it comes down to the you know, review, it's like, well, you haven't done this work. Why haven't they done that work? Right. So maybe that's also so, part of the workflow. So there's sort of two different pieces to this, right? So from the pitch perspective, we have a rule here, we've had it for years, that if someone is brought onto a pitch or, an, or a pitch meeting or an RFP and we get work that that person can do, then they need to be working on that matter. And we do audits periodically to take, make sure that the timekeepers are matching the pitch team. So we are regularly monitoring that. And, and I'm pleased to say that I haven't seen it. The anomalies I've seen have been people left the firm. So that's why they're not working on the matter, right? Um, so that's piece one. The workflow app is a way for us to ensure that we are um, equitably giving work opportunities to all of our population, right? So it's a directory. At its core, what it is, is a directory of all the associates and counsel and our department attorneys. Um, across the firm. And what we ask is that anybody looking to staff a new matter, that at least 30% of the people they consider for staffing on it be from one of those underrepresented groups, uh, women, um, racially diverse, LGBTQ plus, or attorneys with disabilities, and the directory helps them filter out so they can see who those folks are. Um, and then the other piece with the with the directory is that we ask the um, the, the associates to tell us what are the, what's their desired work experience. What's, um, how busy are they? Red, yellow, or green? Red is they are fully utilized. Yellow means they're moderately busy. Green means they're available for more work, which gives them the chance to virtually raise their hands to say, in a hybrid world, right, it's, it's even more important to make sure that nobody's falling out of sight, out of mind. Um, so the workflow app is one tool. It is not the only tool. And, I, and it was created by Diversity Lab uh, through our participation in the Move the Needle initiative. And um, before we launched this, they did help us with an, with an inclusion and belonging survey with our associates so that we actually knew which levers we needed to put some pressure on. And workflow was one of the ones that seemed to be an important issue for our associates and counsel. It, it's been really neat, actually, above and beyond the intended use, right, which is to increase the diversity of the teams and the experience that attorneys are having um, to get that kind of work that they want and need to do, like you said, Monica, in a virtual world, it worked out really well because it, it broke down a lot of the silos of, I'm just going to go next door and give this to Jessica because she's right here, right? It was, you know, I could give this assignment to anybody, but I don't know who speak Spanish and could take this deposition. And I don't know who wants to take a deposition or needs to take a deposition, or I don't know who's admitted in Minnesota, right? And so, you know, there are all these elegant filters that help to identify people, which was, you know, helping people to work with people other than the people they had always worked with, right? And so it created better teams, more diverse teams, but, you know, just even people getting to know each other in a way that they might not have been able to without the app. Mm -hmm. How does, uh, or do you allow partners and associates to um, modify the hours they're working depending on what's happening in their personal lives without penalty? Yeah, I mean, well, so we have, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. um, and we have uh, an attorney work committee and the whole, and actually we've had this in place for a lot, for a number of years. It's where any attorney can ask for some sort of flexible work arrangement, whether it's reduced schedule, whether it's a compressed schedule, whether it's, you know, before the pandemic, whether it was hybrid um, or fully remote. And what we've done is um, set it up for a committee to review versus having to make people ask the people they work with, right? Because what we were hearing was some groups are super easy and everybody could do whatever they wanted to do. Some groups, rightly or wrongly, in some cases there were, you know, pressing client needs, right? But some groups are were, were more difficult. And so we kicked it to the committee so that the committee could really look at these requests across the firm and make sure that every attorney was getting a fair shake at getting 
what they needed in terms of flexibility. Um, we, I'm not going to say that we don't talk to the stakeholders and make sure that we don't understand whether there are underlying performance or other issues or, um, you know, whether there are things that need to be put in place to drive really great communication. But the whole concept of it was to make sure that we were institutionalizing this firm wide and, um, and, and get, giving everybody the opportunity to get what they needed in terms of, of that kind of flexibility to manage both their professional and their personal lives. Thank you. So the um, honor roll equity and inclusion for all category this year expanded to include people with disabilities. How are you, what are you doing for hiring and retention and how have you made a focused effort on the disability category? So first we track that, you know, that which gets measured matters, I think is the saying. Um, so we definitely can I, track. Can I jump in yeah. and there really yeah. quickly? So when you're tracking yeah. disability, what does that look like? So in it's a really big category. Yeah, mm -hmm. in recruiting, yeah. it's um, there's forms that we get for, uh, you know, the candidate paperwork, I guess, um, where there's an option to self-identify, right? Um, but people won't. Some people won't, right? Because of the stigmas attached to it. So what we've done internally, it's all about our culture. It comes down to who we are. We have made a very concerted effort to talk about disabilities, to talk about, to, to do programming, to make sure that we are putting it on our internet, to highlighting the work that some of our folks do with organizations that are focused on individuals with disabilities, right? Mental health is, is various mental health issues are designated as disabilities. And we have a mental health and well-being committee that is focused on destigmatizing uh, these um, issues. So that people do feel safe coming forward and we tell them this is a category that we want to increase. This is a goal of ours is to increase individuals with disabilities that make them Peabody. So by putting ourselves out there as saying this is something we want to do better in, we're hoping that the culture is going to they'll understand like we're not asking you to hide in the shadows. We want to find out a way to help you be your best self. Um, so that's one of the things. And Candidly, it's still very early in the disability inclusion. We, fo we have focused on gender, we focused on race, we focused on LGBTQ+. So I think our credibility in advancing DEI in both categories is helping us um, with this population as well. I, I think the, the, the attorney work committee that I mentioned, that's another place where we're seeing this come up, right? We are, the in, in some ways the pandemic has helped because it's normalized not being in the office five days a week. And if somebody's got a mobility issue or they've got medical needs or appointments or things that make it more difficult to be in the office, um, you know, it's, you know, we, we look at those requests as well and are extremely liberal in granting, you know, the, the necessary level of accommodation and flexibility to support attorneys with disabilities. Before you jump, Stacey, um, what do you most want other law firms to learn from the incredible actions you've taken? I, I mean, I don't want them to learn too much because we <laughs> want to be the best, but it's become like second place. Um, I, I just think it's, you know, it's it's really about, it is about culture, you know, and it is about um, walking the walk and talk, not just talking the talk. And so, um, it, the, the side effects of having a diverse and inclusive environment and culture are really, you know, better client satisfaction without a doubt, um, which is good for the bottom line, um, which is, you know, which, which is good. Like, I, I just think that, you know, the more, the less people think about this as sort of this fluffy HR subject and more about, you know, a, a commitment to the whole attorney, the better a working environment you're going to create for your people, the better success you're going to have in retention, in, in, in recruiting, in, you know, in, 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 um, in, in business development. Like, I just think that um, kind of, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I feel strange that a lot of the theme of what I've been talking about is fear, but like, you know, letting go of the fear that this is not good for business because it really is, you know, excellent for, for business, but most importantly, excellent for our people. How does that trickle down to, or that's not the right term, but how do you see this for the entire firm, including all professional staff as well? So now we, we tend to, law firms tend to look at, you know, revenue per lawyer, profits per partner, impact 
in ways that are focused on the attorneys. So what about the, the others in the firm? Everyone I'm going to let Reka speak to this because she has done incredible work on the staff side too. Um, and I'm going to apologize again a million times for having to, to leave early, but I think it's a good spot for me to leave unless there's anything else you need from me. I want to thank you so much, Monica and Chips, for honoring us. It really is uh, a terrific recognition. And Reka? Got it. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, so the way that we, we approach, there's the, the career trajectory of, of an attorney is different than the career trajectory of a professional staff person. Um, and that's a reality, right? So oftentimes our resource groups are really focused on the path to partnership. And I don't want the staff to focus, to hear this and feel like they don't have a place. So we actually have created resource groups that are pro focused on our professional staff. And this, and it's an incredibly important group of people because what we're really trying to do is it's part of our culture, right? Uh, it, the, the a law firm is not just about the attorneys, although some firms will probably take that stance. Um, I think every single person at the firm has an important role to play in building the organization of the future. And so what we've used these, uh, all of our professional staff resource groups and our attorneys resource group to, to do is, you know, what should some of the priorities for the firm be? Um, and so, for example, one of the things we did, we would focused on um, having a diversity recruiting initiative on the attorney side. And then we saw how we could model something not exactly the same, but similar on the staff side. And so we implemented that on the staff side. And that was something that we saw, you know, tremendous progress in. Um, another area which we did, which we focused on staff side is we were looking at our job descriptions for our professional staff. And so many of them said college degree required. So one of the things we really looked at is, do you really need a college degree to do that? It's like, is that a barrier to opportunity that we are putting literally at the gate to get into Nixon Peabody, right? So mm -hmm. one of the things we started doing was assessing each job individually. Like there's some jobs I'm not like, if you are looking to be into finance, you probably do need a college degree. <laughs> like I'm, I feel like that is uh, most likely something that, that, that they may require, but there are other positions that I don't necessarily think that we need that. Sometimes commensurate, commensurate experience works. Um, another thing we've really focused on with staff is how we're reimbursing for tuition reimbursements, right? If, um, you know, we've updated our policy related to that so that we could make sure that as broad a pool of people who want to go and get advanced degrees or certifications really do focus on that. So um, that's something that we are really thinking about is what stuff will resonate with retention and advancement of our staff. The advancement looks different, but it's still there. And it's just as important that we put effort into it. Um, but then someone put in the chat a question about technical specialists and patent agents. We include them as part of our attorney population. So the programming and initiatives um, are from the, the, our patent agents and our, our uh, IP specialists are part of our um, DEI uh, initiatives that are focused on our attorney population. So just to mm -hmm. give a little perspective there. That's very helpful. Thank you. What are you working on next? I know you have some really ambitious goals set for 2025. How are you going to? continue to advance in the work that you've already done? So when we set the goal, um, candidly, we were pushed. It was part of our, so Diversity Lab, you're always going to hear me sing the praises of uh, Karen Stacey and the rest of the Diversity Lab team. They're amazing. Um, They're amazing. So um, one of the things that we signed up we, to participate in is this Move the Needle initiative, which was we uh, allocated some money and some commitments. By 2025, we were going, we, we said our goal would be focused on our equity partnership ranks the power brokers of the firm in order to get onto our management team, to get onto our compensation team, uh, to be a practice group leader, to have these positions of influence and power, you need to be an equity partner. So what are we going to do to make that more diverse? And with uh, Diversity Labs help, we did an assessment of where we were, and then we set a very ambitious goal. And I will tell you that the in-house counsel who helped, uh, who challenged us on this, pushed us way outside our comfort zone and <laughs> <laughs> and in hindsight I almost wonder how did we how did we get here but this is the thing if you it's a stretch goal we want to be pushed right if you set an easy goal for yourself you meet it and then what we knew that there was a high there was a chance we may not achieve it but part of what our success will be is what we are trying to get there so um I'm really excited to say that for I think four of the last five years of our equity partnership classes at least 50% of the people um, elevated to equity partnership have been women, attorneys of color, LGBTQ attorneys, right? And that and we don't do huge equity partnership classes every year. It's a very small class. So that we're making the strides, we're paying attention. We are focusing on business development opportunities for our, um, for our diverse uh, non-equity partners. 
And we're also focusing on, you know, the stories. We want to know the individuals. We want to know, no, no group is homogenous, right? Within, look at the generational diversity within women in firms. Um, I think there's like three generations, uh, you know, and um, they've all had different lived experiences. They all have different expectations. So what are we doing to make sure that the practices and initiatives we put out there are resonating with each of them? Um, so that's really important is that we really do try to tailor our approach for the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. What is the goal? So, okay. I mean, it's the stuff. So by 2025, our, our equity partnership will be comprised of 30% women, 12% uh, racially or ethnically diverse, and 6% LGBTQ+. Uh, we started at, and I'm so, I may butcher this, I should have pulled this up before I started speaking. I have it, I have it in the report here. Okay. So we started at with women, we started at 17%, I believe. Um, with racially and ethnically diverse equity partners, we started at 6%. And with LGBTQ+, we started at 3%. Yeah. Um, so for us, these are stretch goals. We did, um, with Karen's help at Diversity Lab, we did uh, want to be more ambitious than the ANLA 200 average. So that was where we wanted to stretch ourselves to, to go beyond that. And how are you being intentional about hitting those goals? What has had to change in the firm? Because this this is a you know a thirteen percent change in number of women equity partners. Yeah, and we're already making progress there, so I'm excited. Mm -hmm. We we run some numbers. We're 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 moving in the right direction, yeah, which good. is great. Um, and, um, so we did a lot of things. So one of the things that we've done is um, we work with Diversity Lab to implement interrupters, as they're called. Um, so, but we had surveyed our folks, as I mentioned, we surveyed both our associates uh, and council population and our partner population to really identify um, where opportunities were to do some things differently. Um, so something, an example of something we've done recently, we updated our credit sharing guidelines. They hadn't been updated in a long, in a long time. And this actually came from a conversation our managing partner had with our research groups, our affinity groups, as we call them, uh, the partners in the group. They were sharing stories about times when the guidelines were unclear or when they felt like credit wasn't allocated you know, equitably, whatever. And um, he took that to heart and he put together a committee which interviewed a lot of our partners across the board to get stories about where, this, where the current guidelines fell short. And then we did a big revision on the guidelines um, to offer, bring more clarity. We also created a committee of, of equity partners from a wide range of backgrounds um, who will sort of serve as um, advisors about credit sharing disputes. So if you have a situation where you feel like there is not equitable allocation of credit, you can go to these committee members and get some uh, guidance on how to navigate that. Um, so, and we're tracking that. We are tracking the people who are going to this committee because that's a data point we want to see as well, right? Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. I, um, I've been in firms where, and I think it's typical in all of the career leadership advice we hear around women where they sit back and wait and think, oh, okay, yeah, no, 20% is fair. And the man walks in and demands 80% right. or only offers 20%, whereas in any other meeting, he wouldn't take less than 50. And so there is this discrepancy. And, and I've been in those meetings where as part of a client team, you're saying like, you need to go ask to be lead on that. And what does the lead get? 80%, you need to ask for it. You need to mm -hmm. say, this is what it's worth. And so that I think it's so great that you're doing that and helping to empower people across the firm to understand what equitable is, how to make that share, and then mm -hmm. how to have those hard conversations. Because sometimes people don't want to ask their partner for right. a different share. And women often get penalized for asking, right? Um, it, there's so many articles about women who negotiate salaries are actually penalized more than men who negotiate salaries, right? Yep. So we also have this tightrope to navigate as to how we're going to advocate for ourselves. So it's it's something we want, we really want to empower uh, our all of our attorneys to be their best advocates. Uh, so one of the other things we do is through our research groups, we actually offer a lot of different programming throughout the year. We recently did one on law firm economics. Um, just sort of, we had our CFO come in, our managing partner come in, and they just talked about like, what is what do all these terms mean? How is a firm defined as, from a profitability perspective? Like it was just this transparent conversation and people could ask questions. Um, and it's not that they didn't know it, but some people may never have gotten that insight, right? Um, another thing we've done is uh, with a women's uh, equity partners panel where they talk about how they've developed unique BD styles, business development styles. It is not a one size fits all approach. Some people may be terrified to speak on a panel and prefer to write. You can still bring in business that way, right? Um, so it's about defining your authentic style 
and leaning into it and not trying to fit into a mold that doesn't resonate with you. Um, so we've had programs like that. We've also had programs um, featuring women uh, partners who are moms. Um, because there are certain challenges that women face because of society, and that's a whole other panel we'll probably have a talk on, um, where the pressures and the, um, the, 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 the way that they are, you know, they have to take primary responsibility at home, you know, plus build client base. Um, so we had women who have made it to leadership roles, and equity partnership, talk about how they manage that, what they found useful, what they found not useful. Um, for the next generation to really hear um, some advice on this. So we've really tried to ensure that we're building transparency and creating a culture where we can have these conversations really open. What has been the most challenging part of this work for you personally? Um, for me personally, um, I don't celebrate the small wins enough. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the home run all the time. I feel like that's the thing that gets the press. That's the thing that gets everybody else super excited, right? And when I step back and I actually look at some of the, you know, smaller victories, they have added up. And I think that our expectations are out of line with what is the reality as a whole in the space. Um, we didn't get here over. Like the legal profession has been around for how long? Um, Yet for some reason we've we've taught ourselves to believe that if you don't make if you don't jump in your AMLA diversity scorecard one like huge jump within a year that somehow there's a failure there right so it's about making sure we're talking about what progress we're making and also being really honest about the challenges we're facing um, we just went through what was probably one of the hottest recruiting markets in history in this profession. Um, and clients were poaching us like it was just it was uh -huh. you know and and after like there were diverse talent was at this like peak premium so we developed all this amazing diverse talent and then we were seeing them go in-house which was great because we obviously want them to go to clients but from my perspective I was like but I was really hoping they'd be equity partner by 2025 um yeah. so um, so personally I was frustrated with that but I also had to step back and see that there was a bigger picture here that we need to also well, it's very common in mm -hmm. the legal industry to be a high achiever. Mm. <laughs> and so yeah. I want to be the first to help you celebrate those small wins. <laughs> Thank you. And, Thank you. Um, and yeah, it's really yeah. fantastic. And I, I do hope that you will okay. see. Have you? Well, we yeah. also, I just also, we also read tons of articles about how the profession's failing on diversity, right? I feel like we constantly read these articles. There's a blog about mm. it. There's everything's about it, right? So we're also being fed a message that we are constantly failing. So and this and the small victories aren't the sexy news cycle, right? They're not the ones that are getting traction. Um, the small so victories, all, though, are the ones that are making a difference in that one person's life. Right. Have you had thing. that moment where one person has walked into your office and said, "Rika, thank mm -hmm. you. This is why mm -hmm. this matters to me." Tell us yes. about that. Yes, I have, and that's actually the most powerful ones I've had. People come up to me and say, "Thank you for you know, I'm not going to go into details, but thank you for helping me with the situation." Um, it made the difference. Um, sometimes that's my job here. It's just to help them figure out how to address a challenge. And if I can remove an obstacle, remove it, or at least give them the tools to remove it. And I've had people come and tell me, I'm still here because of how you helped me with this. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when people get promoted and they get to where they want to be, um, and they are, I, I, those are the victories. I know that we may not have overhauled the entire leadership team, but it's one step at a time. It's one person at a time, right? And and the Mansfield rule actually from with diversity Lab has been great in that for leadership roles in particular, not because we weren't get, we didn't have diverse leadership before. It's one tool in our tool belt, but it's given a metric to help to to measure ourselves by, right? And it's it's forced people to have deeper conversations in a way. So I'm a big fan of ways that if I can go to my attorneys and say. Look, we're we're aiming for certification here. We're aiming for certified plus here. Um, so uh, it, it is standard practice at my firm that anytime there is a leadership position open, I get included in that conversation, and we really dig into who we're considering for those opportunities. And I think that's those are wins. That's those are wins. <laughs> I have another question. If um, if anyone here has questions, please put them in the chat. I do want to give another shout out to Karen Ulrich Stacy, who's here. She shared a great HBR article on why and how to set diversity goals with Accenture as an example. That's in the chat if you need it. The honor roll report, which um, has been beautifully designed by um, Rob Ray and the CHIPS team. And I can't see it because I have my, my camera on <laughs> dirt mode. But if you yeah. want print copies, old school style, and you want a volume of them, we can send some to you. Otherwise, the link is in the chat. 
And um, and I'd love to um, find out, I just lost my train of thought. What was the last question I wanted to ask you? It was a really good one. Um, what, uh, shoot, I started talking about Q&A and everything and then I forgot. Um, what, what's something else that you want to share about the work you're doing? Maybe I'll remember my question. Um, you know, I think you asked Stacy this about what you want others to know. And I think one of the things that is that you have to have consistency and patience in this work. Um, you know, it, it goes to the small wins. Um, and also, we can't be afraid of failure. I think that's one of the barriers we find with the profession. Think about it. As lawyers, we are taught to be risk averse and we're taught to look to the past for answers on everything when we are doing client work right? But if you think about it, um, DEI is one space where you actually do need to take some risks. And, um, and the past has no answers for this. So this is uncharted territory. So you have to be willing to try things and have them not succeed, modify them if you can, be willing to scrap them and learn from whatever didn't work. Um, but you got to keep going and you've got to keep trying. It, you know, we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good here. Um, and I think that's something I really do want people to understand here. I, I can tell you, like we have, we had a policy where we thought we were doing something super great and innovative and we put it out there and it turns out there was a blind spot that we didn't even see in the policy, right? And it came to us through our working parents actually raised the issue to us. And so we, when they came back to us and told us about this, I was like, wow, I, I, we didn't see this. So we went back, we modified the policy, and then we updated it. And then we announced what the update was. And we gave credit to the people who came forward to tell us where the shortcomings were on it. Because we want we want people to do this. We want That's what I say about the workflow app. It is a pilot. I mean, we're about a year in, but it's still something. So, so many of the features have come from the feedback from the people using it every single day. Um, so I think yeah, it's that's really great that you have that connectedness because that's how mm -hmm. you're going to know, like a lot of times policies are set with some good intentions, but that's not enough because they're causing the wrong impact. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe been something that's been recycled for so long. And then someone has to speak up and say, actually, this is not serving us. It right. needs to change. And if you don't get that feedback, how do you know? Right. You know, when I first started some issue that someone had brought up to me, which was so interesting, which I hadn't thought of is that, um, this is years ago, our pro bono folks, well-intentioned, were reaching out to the affinity groups for a lot of the pro bono opportunities that were aligned with whatever their affinity, right? Um, and then, so a lot of our resource group and affinity group people felt like we're being overburdened here with requests to take on this pro bono work. Meanwhile, our non-diverse colleagues are being able to do billable work, right? And so well-intentioned things. So one of the things that we have changed is that you have to offer these opportunities to everybody. Um, you know, another, and, and that same goes for uh, diversity dinners, uh, the galas, the, the rubber chicken dinners that every city has. Uh, you know, we buy tables and immediately we're only sending it out to the, you know, affinity population within those offices. Uh, when in fact, it's more, I think it's more impactful to have members of the overrepresented groups participate in those dinners and really, you know, first understand what it's like possibly to be the only one in a room, which all of us have been at some point. Um, you know, nothing creates empathy like having to walk in someone else's shoes. So that's piece one. And piece two, let's not underestimate the allies here. There are a lot of allies looking for opportunities to get engaged. Yeah. They far outnumber whatever people don't understand this, right? And I think engaging them and making them see, understand they have a role to play, an important role to play, is a great way to advance DEI. Well, I know we have a lot of people on this call who are where they are because of allies. Uh, I do remember the, the fabulous other question I wanted to ask you, which is about uh, hiring. And CHIPS is a lot of women with uh, STEM degrees and IP lawyers, and that's a big part of the CHIPS community still. And um, you talked about hiring and professional staff and looking at requirements like what is a college degree really necessary? I'm looking out at you know a lot of the hiring practices that have evolved in law firms are hiring the top X percent from the top X schools. What about HBCUs? What about so, women who have been right. working parents who mm -hmm. have gone through law yeah. school and couldn't go to a top tier school? How are you mm -hmm. finding space for those um, mm -hmm. alternatives in your hiring practices? So I, I bugged Stacey's not here because she would have loved to have talked on this one. <laughs> um, one of the things that we've done is actually for the most part, we don't have summer programs at um, Nixon Peabody. What we did was in 2017, we created an internship program in partnership with Howard Law School. 
during the school year for a law student, a second or a third year, to work in our firm with a specific practice group for at least 20 hours a week. And they got to get prolonged exposure for us. So a whole semester, pass up, up to two semesters, because we renewed it for at least two semesters. And then, um, you know, a, when they graduated, if, if they liked us and, and we liked them, then we would make them an offer to join us as first years. So we saw this, we, we started it with Howard, so an HBCU, um, but we also, we didn't limit the schools we were recruiting from. We cast wide nets. We expanded it to our Boston offices, to our Chicago, LA, San Francisco, New York City, and we did not put the emphasis on pedigree. Any student was who was from an underrepresented background was eligible to apply. And this became a big pipeline for us. And now, our uh, first year class that started this fall, uh, a good chunk of them came through the internship program, which has now evolved. It's actually an internship program where um, at least 50% of the candidates interviewed for the internship must be from an underrepresented background. Um, and so this year, our class was 75% from underrepresented backgrounds. Are, and this internship program has yielded results. So we stopped putting emphasis on pedigree. Um, you know, we aren't specifically focused on underrepresented, I'm sorry, HBCUs, but we are focused on, you know, the schools in the communities in which we live. Um, as someone who went to a law school, I didn't go to a top school, but I, I had a great education. But for me, the factor was tuition, right? I went to an in-state school. Um, and so um, people, the reasons people choose to go to the schools they chose, choose to go to vary. Um, and as far as people who've taken time off, uh, you know, Diversity Lab has the on-ramp program, which has been fantastic for a pipeline, which is helping um, people who have taken time off from practice to get reintegrated back into practice. Uh, we also have a program called our Resident Attorney Program, which is an apprentice model type um, program where people who come to us through non-traditional paths. So we've had folks, uh, someone who worked, uh, went to law school, graduated in 08, and uh, obviously we know what happened in 08. It was a little difficult to find jobs in 08. Uh, became a legal marketing person at a firm and uh, wanted to practice, reached out, and this program was great, and now is on board as, as a part of our, um, you know, uh, I, th I think department attorney program. But the point is, we have a pipeline for people from non-traditional paths to come into the firm because talent comes to us from so many different directions. Why are we limiting ourselves? That's so true. That's such a great point. Uh, I, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, Rick, it's been a pleasure. We would not be here today without Diversity Lab and the partnership that we've created. So thank you to Joan Toth, our executive director, and to Karen Ulrich Stacy, uh, the CEO of Diversity Lab. And I'm really excited to watch the progress you've made, Rika, and the firm at Nixon Peabody. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing your 2025 goals. Thank you so much. And thank you, Monica, for the honor and for having us here today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can always email me later. I'm happy to chat. Um, this is work we all need to be in together. It's not just one firm, mm -hmm. you know, over another. We're all in this. Yeah, well, and I do have this vision that we could all be part of this and we could have a legal industry where um, it's not the industry that people make fun of, right? But actually, yeah. an, in <laughs> an inclusive, <laughs> you know, we could yeah. stop the lawyer jokes, but it could be all that. And it could be the leading example because of the work right. that you're all doing. I would be okay if the lawyer jokes were all about the way we practice law as opposed to what we look like. Like that, would, I'd be at peace with that one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.